we're now live, you can proceed. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get started, we'd like to begin with a brief message from Gilbert Martinez from our communications team for our Spanish speaking viewers. Gilbert. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a la sesión informativa organizada por la supervisora Hopkins y la doctora Mays. Esta sesión informativa se está transmitiendo en vivo por nuestro canal de YouTube con interpretaciones al español. Para escuchar la versión en español, puede us usar el link de YouTube que se encuentra en la página de Facebook del Condado de Sonoma. Gracias. Ahora regresamos con la supervisora Hopkins. Thank you so much, Gilbert. I'm Linda Hopkins, supervisor for Sonoma County's 5th District and chair of the Board of Supervisors. Welcome to our COVID-19 and vaccination community briefing for Wednesday, February 10th. Today, we've got a treat for all of you data nerds like me, number crunchers and statistic watchers. We're gonna take a deep dive into the data today that we have compiled from the first two months of our vaccine rollout. You'll get to see data on who has been administering the vaccines and where they've been administered. You'll also get a close look at who in our community is actually getting these vaccines and how we are doing in terms of reaching our goals to getting vaccines to our most vulnerable residents, including some of the eldest members of our community. Finally, you'll get to hear more about what we're expecting in the near future in terms of how soon we may be getting vaccines to those age 65 and older and others in the sizable phase 1B tier one group. But first, let me start with the good news. I'm pleased to report that Sonoma County has now administered 75,000 doses, which represents 15% of our adult population. I admit that we still have a long ways to go, but I do think it's important to stop and recognize what a significant accomplishment this has been given the limited supply of vaccine that we have received, and that two months ago, we didn't even have a single vaccine. No one did. Yet over the course of just seven weeks, we have established more than 20 clinics and other vaccination sites around the county. And this does not include all the vaccinations that are occurring at the six hospitals in our county or the vaccinations currently being distributed by CVS and Walgreens. This is really a reflection of all the hard work that our county staff and all of our community partners have done to open up these clinics across the county in a matter of weeks. And it's also a testament to what you, the residents of Sonoma County, are doing in terms of sharing information, being patient, and most of all, helping your family members, friends, and neighbors, especially our senior citizens, get appointments, and in some cases, even drive them to their appointments. So thank you for taking care of other members of our community. It's getting us closer and closer to our goal of achieving herd immunity here in Sonoma County. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Supervisor James Gore, who represents the fourth district. He's going to talk a little bit more about our successes and the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you very much, Chair Hopkins. I appreciate the time. I think uh, one of the th reasons that I'm on with you is, even though I represent uh, the fourth district and I'm with you on the board of supervisors, um, I'm going to bring in a little bit of a perspective uh, from the statewide discussion and the policies and the resources that are coming out. Um, I'm the current president of the California State Association of Counties. Uh, we have 58 counties throughout this state, and um, we have 58 different systems of how uh, healthcare is administered. Um, so with a fragmented network, um, this has been one of the difficulties in, uh, in achieving success uh, from a statewide perspective. Um, that being said, um, I think we all know is, is that uh, what's happened is is all of us are trying to get to a place of taking dysfunction that folks have seen of dealing with fragmentation and move it over towards a functional path forward. So uh, beyond the highlights and the platitudes and the generalities, uh, I want to talk about a couple couple specific updates with respect to this. Um, I I don't speak for the state. I negotiate with the state. So I have to start by saying that everything that I'm giving you is our negotiation with the governor, the governor's leads. Uh, uh, Secretary Galley, Secretary Richardson from GovOps, who's managing the vaccine rollout at this point, and um, also the Cabinet Secretary Anamata Santos and the Governor's team. So, um, uh, you know, they they moved forward on 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 uh, January 26 with a proposal, uh, an announcement of a proposal uh, to move forward with what's called a TPA or a third party administrator. Um, since that time, uh, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth, a lot of negotiation, a lot of concerns raised. 
about how such an effort would work, but I want to preface all, the, all of this and say that what we knew what, what was not working um, is the fact that the data system, the so-called CARES system that the state was utilizing uh, previous or still is utilizing at this point, um, wasn't able to capture really the true data on the ground. So, so we would be in a situation where we were meeting with the governor's senior leads, and they'd be holding up a report that said, hey, out of the vaccines we sent to the providers in all these different areas in the counties, uh, the uh, multi-county entities, as we call it, um, the difference between the hospitals, then to the counties that gave to the FQHCs, the federally qualified health clinics, um, and then all, the, all of that they were sending directly to CVS and Walgreens. Um, they, they were holding up these reports saying, hey, we're seeing only 30% allocation of actually going into arms. And at that point, their biggest concern was is that it wasn't um, basically people were sitting on vaccines out in the community. Um, we would go through a process of our 58 counties and with California State Association of Counties and partnership with our health officers to scrub that data, to go through and say, no, it's actually at 65% and here's where it is in different areas. And um, the data system was not good. So we were very strong in our advocacy to say, hey, fix the data system. And our goal has always been, if you're gonna bring in a third party administrator, the goal is, is, is to fix this data system no matter what. No matter how we get into operational management, we need to fix this data system. Um, the governor's administration was attempting with the uh, incoming Biden administration to move towards a, uh, a per capita allocation so that California being 40 million people, the largest state in the nation, we would get it based on our per capita, but it has uh, continued with the previous administration's rollout, which is vaccines from the federal level to the state is based on your effectiveness of getting those into people's arms. And so what that means is that you have to have some kind of just in time data system that justifies and shows all of those uh, allocations going in. And if you have a data problem, uh, that will be a problem for the overall statewide allocation of COVID vaccines and therefore all of us screaming in different counties to get more, more, more because we have capacity. Uh, the biggest thing to realize about this is that California's counties and the different county systems have capacity um, far beyond what the vaccine allocation is. And that's true here in Sonoma County as well, as Chair Hopkins has alluded to. Uh, we do know that the uh, third party administrator that has been negotiated with the governor's office is Blue Shield of California uh, with some cooperation from Kaiser Permanente. Um, it looks like it is going to be a system that is not just a data administrator, but, but, but a uh, operational administrator that actually um, allocates uh, vaccines and creates a new system to be able to take the data back on how effective different providers are at getting those into people's arms. Um, it does appear that still us here in Sonoma County, our primary area of which we get vaccines and then put them um, into the community is going to be through our federally qualified health clinics. When I say that, it's because Sonoma County, we are a unique county in that we do not provide direct patient services anymore. Um, years ago, when we, when, when, uh, we transferred or contracted that over to the Sinead campus going from a county hospital over to a healthcare system with Sutter at that time, we got out of the direct patient care business. So going forward, Sonoma County, as opposed to, as we get all these anecdotes from, hey, this is what I hear is going on in San Mateo. This is Santa Clara. This is Contra Costa. This is what I hear in Marin. It's very difficult because there is not an apple to apple conversation about Sonoma County versus others. Many of those are able to allocate based on the shipments that they receive to directly go to people and uh, in that world, whereas we are a conduit to the federally qualified health clinics. And, um, and then on the other side, we are more of an organizer and an administrator of our own. Um, the only other things uh, that I wanted to mention as a part of that, uh, Supervisor Hopkins, is that we anticipate it'll take two to three weeks for the third party administrator to really take hold. They're starting to do the rounds. This is Blue Shield of California. Um, talking to county healthcare leads and others about how they come in and work with the partnerships that exist, which is what we're asking for. And, um, and then in addition to that, uh, we um, do know that there's a couple other things going on at the state that are relevant to here or at, or at the federal level. One is that we anticipate that with the onset of this TPA or third party administrator is that the My Turn app, the reservation app 
and data set that's been pushed out by the state into pilot counties um, is going to be the statewide system for reservations. Um, that is run by Accenture. And uh, we have had some, we even tried to implement some of that recently. I know Chair Hopkins, you know this in the last two or three days and there's data glitches, there's issues with it. So um, in every place that has been rolled out, we have uh, you know, issues with age and automatic cancellations or, or, or other things. So that's important. And then the uh, other thing is, is that there was an announcement that the federally qualified health clinics are now going to receive direct allocations from the Fed itself. Um, I do know that as of now, that's only about 100 pilot clinics around the country. So that is not going to be what goes into our healthcare system at this time. And our folks don't anticipate getting that ramp up anytime soon. Uh, final thing is, is just um, we did get um, approval uh, for something we pushed for as counties with the governor, uh, which is a $1.2 billion allocation uh, to all 58 counties. Um, that number will equate to about $17.8 million coming into Sonoma County to support vaccinations, uh, contact tracing, testing, and other COVID-related activities. Um, we don't know the exact timeline of when that will be, a, when that will come to us, but uh, there was a joint um, legislative uh, uh, budget committee hearing where they approved it and waived uh, per our request, a 30-day uh, time frame to be able to move through that. So we as the Board of Supervisors, um, under the leadership of our chair and others, are going to have to go through with our public health and decide where we allocate dollars for all of these different areas of direct COVID response. Um, thank you very much, Chair Hopkins. I appreciate that, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Sundari Mace to review um, start reviewing some of the data. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman Hawkins and Supervisor Gore and everybody else who's joining us today. I am going to share my screen so I can pull up the slide. Can everybody see the slides okay? Okay, yes. fantastic. All right, so I'm going to go over uh, first um, the latest data for the blueprint uh, for reopening of the safe, uh, safe economy. Sonoma County does remain in the purple tier, and our case rate, unadjusted and adjusted, is around 20 to 21 uh, cases per day per 100,000 population. And that is down significantly in the last uh, three to four weeks. Our overall testing positivity is 5.5%, again, about half of what it was last month. And the testing positivity in the lowest um, healthy places index quartiles 8.6 percent and that's actually down from 10.5 uh, or 8 percent just a few days ago. So all these numbers are dropping but we are still not near the red tier. We need to be uh, at a case rate of under um, uh, seven uh, cases per uh, day per 100,000 to go into the red tier and both of these test testing positivity percentages need to be less than 8% in order for us to go into the red tier. But we are moving in the right direction. And I wanna stress the importance of testing. The one thing that has happened over the past uh, month uh, to six weeks since uh, the holidays is that we've been testing a lot fewer people. We're under the 3,000 tests per, uh, the, per day that we're doing. Uh, we're closer to about um, 500 tests per day per 100,000 population. And um, we need to get that up. And the reason for this is because um, many people are not getting tested. I think a lot of people wanted to get tested because of the holidays to ensure that everybody was safe. But I wanna underline the importance to continue to get tested, especially if you're concerned that you maybe were you know, out um, in a uh, place where you felt that you could have been exposed or you know, uh, you just have any reason for a concern for testing. You can go on SoCoEmergency.org and you can see all the different places where you can get tested. I wanna uh, specifically say OptumServe, which is a state-run testing platform is available in Santa Rosa, Petaluma, and up in Windsor, and uh, has plenty of appointments of people who want to get tested. What that will do is help us with our adjusting the factor that we multiply by so our adjusted case rate can be significantly better than our unadjusted case rate if we can get more uh, tests done in a day. 
So next, I want to just uh, uh, open the, the conversation about vaccine administration and just say we are doing a fantastic job here in Sonoma County. As you can see, we've uh, given uh, nearly 75,000 vaccines as of February 10th. The residents that, of Sonoma County that have gotten a fourth, first dose are close to uh, 48,000, that is 47,722. And uh, close to 14,000 residents have been fully vaccinated with two doses, meaning that they're done. So having said that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Shende, who is our vaccine chief, to present the rest of the data in the slide. Dr. Shende. I think Kate is on the line and she was going to explain oh. these two because they are. Okay, sorry, yeah, Kate is our uh, lead epidemiologist and she's going to take the next two slides, thank you. Hi there, um, so this slide is summarizing all the different places that Sonoma County residents go to get vaccinated, um, whether that's here inside Sonoma County or they, maybe they were employed um, at a healthcare facility outside of the county and received their vaccination there. Um, this is showing in green on these bars. Those are first doses administered and the yellow color, kind of gold color is second doses administered. And you can see on this chart, um, you know, that there's lots of different players involved in um, getting the county vaccinated. Kaiser um, accounts for the largest majority of vaccinations that we see. Um, partners, local partners such as um, SCMA, DEMA, AMR um, have vaccinated quite a few individuals. Um, Sutter Health, um, and then this line here, and I apologize that the writing is rather small, um, out of county providers um, account for about 7,000 um, of the doses that we see here. Um, CVS is on the next line, Safeway, um, St. Joseph Health. And then we see here all the contributions that our clinics are making um, as well. And these, this um, information comes from the California Immunization Registry, um, which is the same place where we're getting the information to report on the number of doses being administered in the county, the number of residents um, who were vaccinated. One, the uh, benefit of this data is it's all updated at the same time, um, and we can report out on all of these providers. A limitation is that when we look at an entity like Kaiser, for example, um, that is referring to all their regional locations. Um, so it's, these are all referring to residents who've been vaccinated, but they may have gone to a Kaiser in Marin or a Kaiser in San Francisco that would also be included in this total. So we really wanted to know <coughs> more about our local data and be able to get a <coughs> really track how many doses are coming into the county and the processes by which they're going out and um, being utilized. So if you can please go to the next slide. So this, um, this table is looking at some of the provider reporting that we're engaging in, um, because we know that the data in the Cali California Immunization Registry, there's quite a bit of a lag there. Um, sometimes it can take up to a week before we see some of the doses that have been administered show up in those numbers. Um, so we wanted to hear from all of our partners in the community to understand, you know, the doses that they're receiving, because some of those doses, um, you know, go through the state to the county and then are distributed partners, but then other providers like Kaiser or Sutter or St. Joseph, they receive their doses directly from the state. Um, and then there's other providers such as CVS and Walgreens that get federal doses. So there's all sorts of different ways that doses are coming into our county. Um, so you can see, um, it's, there's the provider names listed, um, where they're getting their vaccines from, whether it's county, federal, or state, um, doses that they've reported receiving, and this is cumulative, so this is since um, December, the amount of doses um, that they've been receiving, how many first doses they've administered, second doses they've administered. And then the next column is really interesting because it really speaks to all of the processes and plannings that's involved um, for vaccine stock that um, a provider might have in place. So you can see um, doses to be administered in the next seven days. So these are all the appointments and clinics and other events that are planned, planned to get vaccines out. Um, 
so we and you can see there are still some holes in this data unfortunately you know um there's benefits um, to the local data being able to get a little bit more richness in the reporting, um, but it's also difficult um, to keep all of the reporting up to date at the same time. Um, and some of the providers, you know, if they're part of a regional entity, um, they may not actually know the exact amount that was allocated for them in our county. So there's still some holes and pieces that we're, um, you know, striving to fill in, um, but this is some of the data that we're tracking. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was really helpful. And that helps to also see why it's not so simple as to say how many doses have come in and how many doses have been administered. Um, it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, and it's based on when our doses arrive, how many are allocated for the next week and the week after and second doses, um, and how many are actually administered. So it's a pretty complicated process. Um, so now I'd like to go over uh, information about what proportion of our population has been vaccinated. So um, of course, the only eligible population are those over the age of 16. And at this point, 15% uh, of Sonoma County residents have received at least one dose of the, of the vaccine. Um, so residents with the first dose are 12%. Those who are fully vaccinated with two doses, 3%. So we still have a long ways to go, but um, as Supervisor Hopkins said, we are definitely making progress. And this is in a mere seven weeks. So we're doing all right. Next slide. Um, this slide really is, is helpful to see how we're doing in relation to other counties. And, and the point is really to see how everybody's doing because this is a very, very difficult endeavor for everyone. But when you look at Sonoma County uh, with a population of 499,772 um, and compare that to those that are larger than us as well as smaller than us, we're doing quite well at 14.71%. The range looks like it's from anywhere from 8% to uh, ours, which is 14.7. Um, so in relation to, to many different uh, counties in California, we're doing very, very well. Um, it, it's a bumpy road. It doesn't feel like that every day, but uh, we're, we're making progress and we're administering doses at a faster rate than other counties uh, of our size. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the race and ethnicity, the breakdown of residents vaccinated so far, we can see that the Hispanic Latinx group, 11% um, uh, of doses have been administered thus far, and uh, they comprise 27% of our population. The white uh, uh, subgroup, 64%, and they comprise 62.9%. And uh, further on, um, you can see the, the breakdown. And uh, we anticipate that um, as we move further into the tiers, we're going to see this uh, uh, demographic breakdown start to change quite a bit. Um, the population that has received the majority of the doses so far reflects the population that has been vaccinated, which is the healthcare workers. Um, and as we move into different groups within the, the community, we're going to see those numbers start to change. Next slide, please. So in terms of age groups vaccinated, uh, we're making great progress in our goal of trying to vaccinate those over 75%, which as we've discussed before, have the highest mortality. Um, those over 75% comprise about 10% of our population, but have um, two thirds of the mortality in Sonoma County. So at this point, 45% uh, of 75 year olds and up have received at least one dose. Um, so we're making great progress and uh, that percentage underlied our dis decision this past Monday to go to over 70 as the age group next to be vaccinated. Um, within the 65 to 74 age group, as you can see, 20% um, so far have been vaccinated, 2% have received both doses. Um, and our plan is that as we continue moving along and vaccinate more of our 70 plus, uh, we would like to use the same kind of benchmark. Once we get to about 35 to 40% of the over 70 years old, year olds, then we plan to go to the over 65 year olds. But as we've discussed before, it really depends on vaccine supply and that's why we are uh, going a little bit slowly. Um, in terms of the next age group, 55 to 64, 45, up, they all are about 6% uh, who've received one dose, 10% who've received two doses. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the sex of the residents vaccinated, uh, females 61.5% uh, and males 38%. And again, we will continue to track this going for forward. Um, in terms of females, looks like uh, those who are fully vaccinated um, at about 
38,000 and males about uh, 22,000. Next slide, please. So this gives us a breakdown of those who've been vaccinated by zip code. And uh, as per our previous slides, we'll be continuing to uh, follow this information as we move forward in our vaccination of, uh, efforts. So at this point, uh, those who are in zip code 95409 have the highest rate of vaccination at this point, and the second highest is 95403. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's helpful to see, um, I think our next slide will tell us the city breakdown, but, uh, but helpful to see per zip code <clears throat> where we are. The next slide, please. It's a hard slide to read, but um, the zip codes with the highest proportion of residents with at least one dose are 95444, 26% in Grayton. The next one is 95409 with 20% of uh, in Santa Rosa, 19% um, in Kenwood, 18% of our vaccines so far are Bodega Bay, 17% Cloverdale, 70% Geyserville. So it's a pretty, pretty even distribution uh, throughout Sonoma County. And I think that might be our last slide. There we go. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Mace. Thank you so much for that information. That was a lot of information to digest. And I'm sure that uh, members of our community have a lot of questions, which we will be getting to. Um, but I do have a few questions that I'd like to start us off with. I also want to mention to members of the public that we do plan to post these slides on social media. So if you had a hard time seeing them, you know, especially if you're on a mobile device, we will have an opportunity for you to be able to dive into that on your own, you know, blow it up and, and sort of see what you can see um, and get into the details yourself. You know, one of the things that was mentioned early on, Dr. Mace, is there's a difference between the adjusted case rate and the actual case rate. And right now our adjusted case rate is actually higher than our actual case rate. So would you mind providing a little bit of information about how the state makes that determination and how do we get that working in our favor again? Yeah, thanks so much. Cause we have been at an adjusted case rate of 0.5 meaning that we could have our case rate. So how is that determined? Well, you're rewarded by the state. Each county is rewarded for the amount of testing that they do. So uh, if you're at the state median for testing, in other words, the average of all the counties in the state, you don't get any multiplication factor. It's actually one. So your adjusted case rate would equal your unadjusted one. Now, if you are testing above the median for the state, then you get a multiplication factor depending on how much you're testing. So um, for example, uh, when we were testing about 620, doing 620 tests per 100,000 population and we're well above 3,000, 3,500 tests a day, the state median was actually down at 400 something. So we were able to get a case multiplication factor of 0.6 or 0.5. Now um, it looks like the state median has gone up, which makes it even more challenging for us to be significantly high enough to get a multiplication factor of 0.5 or 0.6, but simultaneously, as I mentioned earlier, our testing has gone down. And I think the, uh, the main reason for that actually is a lower demand. Um, people, I think, uh, were much more likely to get tested around the holidays because they're concerned about family and friends and potential for um, exposures. But uh, I wanna then again, underline the importance for everybody to get, get out there and go ahead and get a test. Like, you know, we know that up to 25-30% um, of people with COVID are asymptomatic. So it's still worthwhile, even though that we have the, the vaccine, because as you can see from Dr. Shende's presentation, we are marching through vaccination, but we're not going to get to the uh, later phases and tiers soon. So absolutely more testing will help our county get that better case adjustment. Thank you for that information. You know, the question I have and that everyone is really talking about right now is schools. Um, do we, you know, what's happening on that? What is the path forward for school reopening? And I understand that there is some positive data um, trending in that direction. So maybe you could explain that a little bit to the community. And then I think, oh, Supervisor Gort looked like you wanted to jump in. I don't know if you wanted to mention before we go to the schools topic. The only thing I wanted to mention with the adjusted case rate is that's actually something that we're working on the state with for them to revise that because Dr. Mace, what, what I think she alluded to, but, but I, I want to address this straight on is, is that 
a lot of the people who were driving our high rates uh, of testing, which was a huge positive for us, are now getting vaccinated as the highest priority. So the same individuals who are the healthcare workers, uh, specifically a lot of essential workers and other things, as we go into that, it's anticipated that uh, it's gonna be more difficult to get people to go in and keep getting testing once they've been vaccinated. And so we're working with the state to kind of redefine that because that we don't want that to be something that holds us back in the tears. Great. And Dr. Mace, if you wanted to jump in on the school's yes. question. Thank you. To answer your question about schools, there's good news on that forefront. Um, that any county per the state has to be at a case rate of under 25 cases uh, per day per 100,000 in order to be considered uh, for schools to reopen and submit their, they can submit their plan, but they can't move towards reopening until we have a case rate of under 25 for five consecutive days. And on Monday, this Monday, we reached that, with that Monday being the fifth consecutive day of having a case rate under 25. As you saw, we were somewhere around 20 to 21 at now. So the good news is that schools in the kindergarten, PK to sixth grade, have the opportunity to open as long as their reopening plans have been submitted, approved, and posted. So uh, schools that had waivers before, um, we were, had approved about nine or 10 schools somewhere around November or so to open, can simply go ahead and open at this time as long as they've submitted a uh, reopening plan. Schools that never had a waiver have to submit a reopening plan to public health. And we have a team um, looking at these reopening plans and approving them or giving feedback so that we can approve them. And then once approved, these schools can move forward towards opening safely as well. Now, the seven through 12 grades at this time can't open. We have to be in the red tier in order for them to consider opening. Thank you so much um, for that information. And I know that parents are certainly eager to, to learn more and hope that their school is in the queue um, with one of those plans submitted. Um, you know, I do want to acknowledge that some of the information that we shared was very positive with respect to just getting shots into arms. And I believe that we do have two of our healthcare providers joining us this evening. I think we have Erin Neal from Sutter as well as Dr. Rajesh from St. Joseph. And I'm wondering if you two might be willing to share a little bit about how things are going. And I also just wanna say thank you for your work um, trying to get those vaccines into the arms of Sonoma County residents as quickly as possible. Erin, did you wanna start? Sure, um, can you hear me? Great. Um, yes. You know, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here and be on this panel today. Uh, I just can't tell you how exciting it is with the hope that comes with being able to provide these vaccines. Um, it's really life affirming to walk through a vaccine clinic and see people so, so grateful to be seeing this and, and our part in helping to end this pandemic. Um, as you know, we're actively working to build our capacity as quickly as we can across the entire center footprint from Sonoma and Sonoma County here. And we've um, been scaling our existing clinics and we have a large scale vaccine clinic for the Sutter Foundation. And it's an important strategy that we put in place to deploy as much vaccine as possible. And we're always an advocate for trying to bring more vaccine in. Um, our appointment availability is really predicated on our vaccine supply um, from the state. So in order to avoid canceling any appointments and that disappointment that comes with that, we've really limited our, um, availability, you know, our availability of appointments um, with our vaccine supply, it's completely tied. And as um, Supervisor Gore has been talking about with the work he's doing at the state, we hear weekly state state what our allocation is gonna be. And that's how we expand our appointment capacity. Um, I encourage people to keep checking back on our website and on our My Health Online to see what we have available. But it's um, an exciting time in this pandemic Thank you so much, Erin. And I'm wondering if Dr. Renadiv would like to share a little bit about how things are going over there at St. Joseph's. So yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, <clears throat> so basically, you know, uh, so just like other healthcare partners in this community, we are trying to do, uh, you know, uh, we, are tr we are trying to increase uh, the number of vaccinations being uh, given to our patient population. So 
initially we had some spacing issues and the limitations over there. So we had a soft launch last week. And then since then, since then we have moved to Grace Pavilion and to, uh, which, and we started vaccinating this Monday from Grace Pavilion. And so far we have given about 2,500 shots in the arms for, for patients. Um, and we are averaging, on, on, we are targeting at least about 500 uh, shots per day. Uh, again, allocation of shots is a rate limiting factor. And also one of the things we're understanding is maybe starting next week, given that all the other, the Grace Pavilion will be filled uh, with, um, so all the parts will be filled over there. Uh, but I understand that we, we are being limited now to around 300 shots a day, but we're trying our best to see what other things we could do to increase that number and, and target for at least like 500 shots uh, per day. Again, allocation continues to be a challenge for us and it becomes difficult for us to, uh, you know, and, uh, schedule patients accordingly. So, so that's, where, uh, that's where we currently stand right now. Thank you so much for that update. And thank you so much for your efforts to get those shots into folks' arms. You know, I was on a Zoom meeting with the healthcare um, partners, CEOs earlier today, and universally what they said the biggest challenge is, is supply. And it's also the unpredictability of the supply. So folks don't wanna book, you know, appointments too far out because they don't actually know, you know, how many vaccines they will have on hand in order to be able to plan, you know, much beyond, beyond sort of the next week. And so I, I understand that that's been a challenge for you as well. Do you have any comments on the challenges with respect to supply and a lack of predictability? Well, the, the biggest cha challenge is like scheduling our patients, right? For, so for example, uh, with the current allocation, we, we should be done um, by end of next week, we would be done and we wouldn't have any more uh, shots to give out. And remember, just remember, this is still uh, Pfizer and Moderna we're talking where these are two shots are required. So, you know, you know it's not unlike Johnson & Johnson, which is only a single shot in the arm and you're done. So that, that is our biggest challenge, the allocations and having difficulty to plan this. We have reached out to basically uh, like a population of like 75 and older who are, many of them are technologically challenged. Uh, we have to like physically go through our list and call each individual uh, patient individually, uh, you know. So we have our office staff among answering other phone calls, the daily phone calls for our routine follow-ups and all are doing this on the side also. So these are some of the challenges we are uh, currently facing, but you know, everybody else is also facing similar challenges. So we are trying to do our best to, to be out there and to vaccinate everybody. Thank you so much for that information. Supervisor Gore, I'm wondering if you have any information on the implementation of this third party administrator. Is that expected to help at all with the predictability of supply? I mean, I think that it sounds like the state is putting a lot of stock in this new plan um, and really you know, has faith that this will help improve the vaccination system going forward. What are you hearing um, about the third party administrator implementation? You know, quite honestly, at this point, it remains to be seen. There's a lot of hope that it works by the governor's office. I mean, they're the, I, I mean, for them, trying to work with 58 counties has been a lesson in uh, futility. Uh, in a, but I would say, from the side of us in the counties, the frustration has been the lack of data support and other things for us to report back. So, you know, when the state sends allocations to our large healthcare providers, when they do direct allocations to CVS. Um, and Walgreens and others, and we can't track those, but we're expected to report them back just in time to support their efforts. That's where it's really fallen down, right? And, um, and all of that really, as I mentioned before, is the thing that's going to be relevant for increased overall vaccine allocations into the entire state. Uh, the one good thing I, some people have seen is there was also uh, uh, FEMA sites for large FEMA sites that are um, opening up. Um, to do uh, thousands of vaccines daily in large metropolitan areas, but those are not going to help us in uh, what you would call kind of suburban sized counties or rural counties. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is that, um, as, as we've talked about before, is, is that the continued frustration in our communities is, is that the state eligibility with that they've opened up opens up a majority of our population when we still have a trickle of vaccines. And so people's expectations are set that once they're eligible, they should have a um, uh, they should have a reservation set up very soon. When in fact, 
you know, we don't have the supply overall. Uh, Supervisor Hopkins, I think one of the main things also that all of us um, talk about is, first of all, I appreciate having um, uh, you know, Memorial and Sutter on the call and then Kaiser administrator as well. Um, but we have a network of federally qualified health clinics. Uh, you have them out in West County. Um, I have Alliance and Alexander Valley up here. We all have Santa Rosa Community Health um, in our areas and they're going to have to vaccinate hundreds of thousands of people and there is a big challenge there and it's reimbursement rates. Um, they can do the work but they can't go broke doing the work. So we have more than 60 individuals who have come in from the state uh, staff that, that we have deployed into those areas. Um, but the reimbursement rate for vaccines, I think for the first vaccine is $17 and the second one is like 20 or $22. And that doesn't cover the costs. So we can't have our clinics go under while they are doing the vaccination work. And let's remind ourselves that the clinics are the ones who serve predominantly what we focus on as the equity priority. That is for the Medi-Cal recipients and the uninsured. So um, there's a lot of work needed going forward to support that effort as that is, go that is a primary focus for us, um, not only with the Latinx population, but, uh, but a lot of vulnerable individuals throughout our community. Thank you very much. Um, last question before I really wanna open it up to uh, members of the public. And you know, this I'll, I'll do sort of a few rapid fire questions surrounding the statistics, right? Notice that there are a lot more women than men um, receiving vaccines. Also notice that there's a high percentage of unknowns um, sort of when it comes to the race and ethnicity data, which we think is so important from an equity perspective, given that our Latinx population has been disproportionately impacted by the disease. Um, you know, and, and we're really trying to focus on targeting our essential workers and supporting that population. So just kind of wondering about those two things. And then the question that I think is on a lot of folks mind, when do we get to 65 and over? Um, you know, I continue to hear from residents who are, are wondering when will that tier open up so that they have an ability to get in line for a vaccine? I don't know if Dr. Mace or Dr. Shende, if you want to tag team on that lightning round and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I can take the question about uh, when we get to over 65. Um, as I mentioned before, we're looking at the numbers and once we get to roughly 35 to 40% of our over 70 uh, population, then we'll feel that we're ready to go to the over 65 population. And again, we wish we could give a specific date for that, um, but it really depends on how uh, our vaccine supply goes as well as uh, how quickly we're able to get everyone vaccinated. Um, in terms of the, the question about um, the unknown category and women. I, I think uh, I'll see if Kate is on the line still, if she's able to give a little more information. Sure. Um, well, around um, seeing more women than men, um, I think that may um, be in part to do with demographics of the healthcare population who was vaccinated first. Um, I think that may be playing into that. Um, I'm guessing things will balance out a little bit more as we expand populations that we're working with. Um, around the race and ethnicity data, um, the amount of individuals falling into other and unknown categories um, has been concerning to us um, because demographic data is a really um, important tool in equity and it helps us understand you know, is if reach and access to vaccinations is equitable in our county. Um, so there's two things I would kind of say around that. Um, I actually got a text during this call that there's a state call going on right now um, and other counties are also expressing that they're seeing an unusually high number of unknowns and others in the data. Um, and so the state says they're going to look into that to make sure that it isn't something to do with the immunization registry and the way that it's intaking data. Um, so that's one way that that's gonna be looked at. And I would say that other piece is, you know, if um, folks are going to get vaccinated, I would encourage them to share information just because it's going to help um, the county be more informed in a response. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes the buckets that are provided for race and ethnicity may not always feel personally applicable. Um, but if, you know, if you're able to select the option that feels like the best fit of those there, um, it helps you be represented in the data. Um, and so I, I think it, you know, we're looking into it and we're hoping to reduce that. And it's a challenge we faced around testing as well, where we had about 20% of um, our testing data where we didn't know race and ethnicity. And that continues to be the case. 
Thank you, Katie. If I may add to that same question, I want to encourage um, some more Spanish speaker, like mi gente, we want to make sure that we're represented on these numbers, right? And encouraging that you are getting vaccinated, you are safe. We are, um, this is information that's sticking with us and, and it is a way for us to be represented through the numbers and we want to be able to capture that. So if you do have a chance of, um, and you are eligible for a vaccine, please um, make sure you um, select the box that fits the best, even though we understand that there might be um, better options out there to capturing that, but we would encourage that. Thank you so much um, for that, Dania. And it's frustrating when some of the questions feel like they are not as culturally complete or as culturally relevant or sensitive as they could be, and yet we're boxed into this literally boxes, right, of a framework. Um, and so, but the more information we can have, the better, because that will show whether our programs are actually working. If we don't know, it's challenging for us to um, do better, you know, if we can't track that information. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul um, to take questions from the audience. Hi, good evening, everybody. Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County. This is a great discussion. Um, we've covered a lot of territory here. We do have questions um, from our public. We really appreciate everybody's patience here. Let me let me address a couple of uh, questions, uh, comments that were raised right away. First of all, yes, we are, as uh, Chair Hopkins mentioned, we are going to be posting all these slides on social media. We're, we're getting those up as we speak. And so, um, uh, we, uh, you should be able to look, take a closer look at the data we presented tonight. We certainly know that's a lot and they're hard to see on a Zoom call. Second, um, there was a question about, um, about the, on the vaccination chart, the, uh, there was a comment about how the dose numbers don't add up. Uh, just a quick comment that yes, they, they do add up. You just have to, if you look at the total number of first doses administered as well, and then you take the number of second doses administered. You have to, you have to double the second vote of uh, doses um, times that by two, and add that to the first doses, and then it does come to the total for the vaccines administered. Um, that's a quick explanation, but I, I hope that uh, that suffices for now. And then, um, uh, uh, so the, there is a question about. Um, uh, kind of more at getting at where our infections are still coming from. I mean, we d we do have we we we've seen our numbers drop, but we still are um, in a uh, precarious time. The the question is, do county officials know where the infections that we have now are coming from in our population and in what industries? And uh, by extension, do we know are we targeting those in our vaccination rollout? Yeah, thanks for that um, question, um, Paul. But I think Kate Hack from our EPI team might be the best to answer the first part of that, at least, of where the infections are coming from. Hi. Um, yeah. So we we continue to see high rates of um, household infection, but you know, of course, those infections are entering from somewhere, um, and. Agriculture, in the agriculture industry, we have um, begun to see outbreaks um, again recently. Um, and some of the, you know, and in, in we continue to see cases among um, sales and service. And um, I would say that the trends have stayed, um, have stayed pretty steady um, in terms of, you know, continuing to see healthcare, agriculture cases, sales and service um, throughout, along with a large proportion of our cases um, through household spread um, once, once a member of the household brings um, the infection in. Great, thank you. There also were a couple of questions concerning the um, appointments at the Safeway um, pharmacies, we, as we've reported, there are 11 pharmacies in the county are now operating vaccines. Um, yes, those appointments filled up very quickly, um, um, but uh, we, uh, they are, um, we, they do, we will be opening up more appointments as we go. I don't know if we have any updates on that, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Shendi or Ken, if you have any more information about what, how Safeway is doing. You're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Safeway will be uh, opening up their uh, appointments on a weekly basis because be because they have to uh, know what their allocations are weekly. And that depends on what we what information we get from the state. So uh, they should open up appointments um, again uh, for the next week and or the week after. 
Um, and uh, we're hoping that they will be able to increase the capacity in the stores as well. So uh, remains to be seen exactly when and how much, but there will be some uh, improvement in the capacity for the Safeway in store. Yeah. And one thing to remember is that while they, they are taking first doses now, they'll be doing second doses later. And so the, um, it'll seem like things are closed off when in fact they're simply doing the second doses of those people that are being vaccinated first dose right now. Great, thank you. And one other thing, we do wanna uh, remind people to that, that we do know that people are checking those uh, appointment uh, um, schedulers uh, quite often to see if appointments do open up. We do wanna encourage people that if you have booked more than one appointment, because you've, you found one that you could get sooner, please go back and, and cancel your other one. Um, we, we are having a problem of, of some no-shows. Uh, Ken, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, and, and we experienced this with uh, with the testing uh, testing facilities as well. Is that people would either go to multiple facilities, or they would get an appointment uh, far enough out that then they would find another location that could do it earlier, and simply go to that location that that would do the appointment earlier, and forget to um, to cancel that second appointment that they had. So it, it really is, um, I guess, part of the social contract that if we do have an appointment that we can't make, try and, um, uh, try and cancel that uh, so that it makes space for another person that desperately needs the vaccine. And then um, we have a question that I know that has come up and we probably will come more as we, uh, as we go along in our rollout of vaccinations. And the question is, is the vaccine voluntary? And can I get fired from my job if I decide not to get the vaccine? So under rules of uh, EUA, emergency use authorization, um, the vaccine cannot be required by anyone, by any profession, by any job. Um, it, it is voluntary. And uh, so no, it, it cannot be used as a requirement for employment. So thank you, Dr. Shende. That's an important thing to uh, remind um, our listeners. Okay, let's go to some of our media uh, partners. Let's start with uh, Martin Espinoza, the Press Democrat. Martin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for this, uh, all the great information here. Um, I wanted to, uh, to go back to the, some, of the, some of the data on uh, demographics and ethnicity. Um, the 11% for the Hispanic or Latino, is that all doses or, or just first doses? Because I think that pretty much mirrors what we saw last week. Is that right? Um, that data is showing that's of all individuals who got at least one dose. Um, <clears throat> so that includes first and second doses. Um, right. And that, that proportion um, is out of known race and ethnicity. So that's excluding individuals who are in the other or the unknown categories and calculating that percentage. I think that's an improvement then from last week because I think last week it was the first dose was one was nine percent. Is that? Am um, I? Yeah. Yep. I would. I would need to look back. Um. And I. Um. To to look at that. Um. But and I. Yeah. I can. I can follow up with you if it would be helpful, Martin. Um. After about that. Well, you guys can trust me on that. But uh, is is this a sign that that we are? Uh, work uh, that we're uh, having some success with equity in, the, in our partnership with uh, our clinics? Yes, we're certainly having success with our partners. Um, our FQHCs have made uh, incredible strides in reaching out to the farm worker and the ag agricultural community and uh, are, are really targeting um, offering the vaccine to these groups. So I think uh, in the next week, as this data continues to um, be evaluated, we're going to see a, a big change in the numbers. Great. I mean, I just, just from talking to some of the FQHCs this week, you know, they're throwing out numbers of hundreds of people that they're vaccinating on a day. Right. And with a, with a large share of that being the, uh, you know, the, the, the Latinx population. So um, I'd expect, yeah, I would expect those numbers to also change by are you guys doing this calculation every day? 
Um, so we will be putting um, the demographics up on the website and then it would be um, refreshed daily. I have other questions, but I'll let others add. I wanted to add one other thing too. This is this is James um, Martin, kind of per your per your question. Also, the opening of a lot of the, the, the clinics um, will just be let's be very direct, especially in like North County, a prime agricultural area. Alexander Valley and Alliance are primary providers for farm workers, and we really weren't able to because of the priority for seventy five plus move into that farm worker category until recently. And um, Dr. Shende and a couple others joined me on a call with them, and they were gearing up for their uh, um, for their clinic this weekend. And um, you know, actually, my mother-in-law is is uh, is 75. We took her down there to get her shot, and there was uh, what we saw was 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 actually pretty awesome. There was uh, they had set up well. There was mariachi music playing. They got people in 15 and out. And there was a lot of outreach that had been done through uh, the Farm Bureau and others to get actually uh, um, companies um, to give people, uh, uh, well, well to, to work to set up blocks of 20 and 30 individuals. I know Constellation, um, who my brother works for, had lined up uh, 30 people at a time um, and others to get in and do their work. And then also to have the, uh, the necessary documentation to prove that they're, that they're, that they're ag workers. Um, I don't mean that in a bad way to keep people out, but we do, we, we do have at some of the clinics where, where they're having to vet people, um, not specific to farm workers, but others to make sure that they um, are an essential worker or whatever like that. So um, I just know that, you know, and also Dr. Shende was in a tough situation with us with in the conversation with those FQHCs where they're saying, hey, if I can, you know, we're outreaching to people that it's very hard to get them in. If, if it's like two people who are 75 and they, but they have a developmentally disabled kid who's 45, can we give him the vaccine too? If we have farm workers show up, but they're 63 and not 65 or whatever, can we do this? And I wanna thank Dr. Shende and others for, for making sure that our guidance is really guidance because these folks who are doing the administration in those clinics, they need to be able to get those, those shots into arms. And so, the goal for us was to try and let also our partners know is, is we're not trying to catch you. And it's not like we're trying to create stories about if somebody was two years younger or three years older or whatever, we're trying to get it done in the most equitable way possible. And it means it's not gonna always fit into the box. Thank you, James, um, Supervisor Gore, really. And if I may add, I just wanna, you know, the equity framework that we really had developed as a vaccine equity strategy, one of the components was the location aspect of things. So working with our operations team and ensuring that operation, that location was a key component, right? And really relying on those trusted partners to ensure that they're the trusted messengers to reach out to our most, um, to our communities. So um, it goes all goes back to strategy building and partnership and ensuring that we are really working together as community to, to connect to the most, um, one of the most important groups in our community. Thank you. Great, thank you all. Let's go to uh, Carrie Benefield. Carrie. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, so on Monday, uh, we were at 15 districts or schools having submitted their COVID safety plans, and I'm wondering if that number has changed um, since then, and if there's a breakdown of where those 15 are approved, sent back, etc. And then as a follow-up, just so you know, um, can you say how many of those were from schools or districts that already had a waiver kind of going into this new process? Yeah, uh, thanks, Carrie. I think I'll see, I think Adam Radke, Deputy County Council is still on. And so I don't know, Adam, if you wanna uh, try your shot at those numbers. I, I don't have a breakdown for you um, right now. Um, I did talk to the public health nurses today um, they seem to still indicate that the uh, number of applications is still approximately 15. Uh, they approved Spring Hill, and they believe that there are about two or three that are getting really close to final approval. Um, but as to as as and I know that that the 15 include public charter and private schools. But as to the actual breakdown, um, I don't have that number offhand. But uh, we can get you that information um, after. Okay, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, let's go to uh, Phil Barber from the Press Democrat. 
Um, is the Sutter representative still part of the Zoom? Yes, I'm still here. Hi, hi, Aaron. Thank you. Um, so I noticed that in the uh, chart on um, doses coming into and out of uh, our various health partners, um, there was no overall figure uh, for Sutter allocation coming in. Um, I, I, in the past, just recently, a Sutter representative told me that's because uh, doses are often transferred between um, Sutter facilities in different counties, so it's hard to keep track of, you know, whose allocation is getting used where, which makes sense to me, but I'm not sure why that's more true for Sutter than it is for Kaiser and Providence St. Joseph. Um, so wondering if you or somebody could explain that gap and uh, if there's anything Sutter can do about it. Um, I, I don't really have an answer to that question because the allocation comes from the state to the federal system. And then um, as we set up our appointments in our vaccine clinics, it is then allocated to us in, in our area, in the county. So we put in our request and we're, because we're a multi-county uh, multi entity, it then we get certain amount per Sutter and then it gets distributed that way. So it's, I don't have a straightforward, I apologize, I don't have a straightforward answer for that question. But I, I just know that we advocate weekly for as much as we can get according to our patient population. Okay, thank you. And um, I had a quick question for Kate, if she's still there. Um, the uh, the issue with a lot of uh, recipients checking the the other or mixed race box with the demographic data is um, is that one of the is that like a box they can check that says other or do not wish to state or are people just leaving that blank? Do, do you know? Hi. Um... So, you know, I know what things look on the back end side of the data. Um, one of the hospital representatives or someone else from public health may know more what that looks like on the actual administration side. Um, I think it's, you know, how it's entered into the care database. Um, but as I mentioned, this seems to be an issue that other counties are experiencing and concerned about as well. Um, so the state is going to be doing some troubleshooting to make sure that this is, you know, actually what's happening, that people are checking those boxes and we're seeing a larger proportion there and that it's not something to do with the immunization registry itself and the way that it's in taking data. Um, so I think kind of more, more to come on that as the state looks into it. Okay, great. And uh, I'm sorry to uh, be a hog, but if I could ask Dr. Mace one question, um, I've corresponded with a couple others at the county um, about uh, the, the fact that it looks like on one data site that the so-called California variant um, has been detected in Lake County and Marin County. I know that's not Sonoma, but I'm wondering, um, in your eyes, do you think that means it's here in our communities already? And either way, what does that mean? What, what do we know about that variant specifically at this point? Yeah, great question, Phil. I'm gonna turn this over to our deputy health officer. Dr. Baldwin to respond. Hi, Phil. Um, yes, I saw your question earlier. I actually don't know, I've not heard of the California variant in um, Lake and Marin. I did uh, find out or, or hear about the UK variant, not UK, the South African variant being um, uh, identified in Santa Clara and Alameda counties today. And I believe there was a press release about that today. Um, two separate individuals. Alameda County seems to be still doing their investigation, but Santa Clara County, uh, this couple or person traveled outside of the US internationally and came back, did the right thing and quarantined, self-quarantined for 10 days. Um, and uh, their sample was found to have the, the South Africa variant, which I think is the first these are the first two identified in California. In Southern California, it's been the, the UK variant that they've been 
identifying. Um, but I'm not sure about the, the, Cala, the California variant. Um, I, uh, I can ask some more questions and if I, if I get some answers to that, I can, I can email you. Uh, really appreciate that. Is there, is there anything that you do, whether you know about the incidents in our neighboring counties, is there anything Dr. Mace or Dr. Baldwin can say about the California variant at this point, or, or do we have any idea about transmission or uh, fatality or anything like that? Again, I, I don't, I've not, this is the first time I've heard of the California variant. I've, I've heard of the three that are floating oh, okay. around um, worldwide, but that's the first I've, I've heard of that. So again, I can do some more investigation um, as far as the California variant uh, and get back to you on that. Okay, thank so you. We can, uh, we, can, we can work with you and see if we can get something for you uh, tomorrow. Um, okay. Yeah. Appreciate that. So, I think a lot of people call it the uh, B1429 uh, in the research lab, but thank, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, Martin, did, we're going to wrap it up soon, but Martin, did you have one more follow-up? Uh, yeah, I had a, a question about, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I distrust hospitals, but um, the Memorial Hospital, and I don't know if, uh, if uh, the doctor is still on there, uh, it looks like they have a large share of their doses that have not been administered. Uh, and I'm just wondering um, why that is. Uh, frankly, I mean, are they sitting on vaccine? Or is it... Uh, you know, with the health centers, they don't have that cold storage that uh, that some of the hospitals do, and so they can't hold on to that vaccine very long. They administer it as soon as they get it, or within days. They constantly keeping it, uh, you know, resupplying or uh, keeping it cold with um, with uh, what is it, uh, uh, dry ice or. I don't know if the uh, hospital official could respond to why it is that they're you know, not administering more vaccine if they have it. Martin, I don't know, this is Ken Tassif. I don't know if uh, Memorial's on right now, but I, I will share with you that starting on Monday, Memorial started operating out of Grace Pavilion and has been doing a great job. As a matter of fact, they were one of two uh, operators that were working out of there today. And they, um, those two operators uh, administered a thousand injections this uh, just today and as a matter of fact the the two um, operators will have scheduled 1150 for tomorrow so i can uh, i can share with you that they've they've been doing a great job out of the um out of grace pavilion uh, these last several days during this week and they're going to be a regular fixture there okay that's all i have okay thank you um we have uh, this was a great conversation, covered a lot of territory. We're, we're well after the top of the hour, but uh, we want to thank you all for your patience and your, your great questions. And I'm going to return it to Chair Hopkins. Thank you so much, Paul, for leading the question and answer session. And I'd also just like to thank Jordi, our Spanish interpreter, and Elizabeth, our ASL interpreter. As a reminder, we'll be here same time, same place next week. And you can always go to socoemergency.org slash vaccine for more real-time information on the vaccination rollout. You can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and last thing, I just wanna say thank you so much to uh, the team of folks who make these, ha this, these meetings happen every single week. I know that our public information officers work around the clock to pull off these briefings. And so thanks to all the folks who are behind the scenes that you all can't see out in the audience, but I see all of their names as participants who are monitoring and supporting. So thanks everyone, have a good week and stay safe.